Welcome everyone to our ongoing series of science sharing uh, webinars today. And uh, we are uh, honored to have uh, Judah Cohen, Director of Seasonal Forecasting for Atmospheric and Environmental Research. And um, so uh, Judah, I'd go ahead and let's uh, talk about doing improved winter forecasts. Should be interesting. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, so I'm going to start out discussing um, I know we, we, we use snow cover to make uh, predictions for the, for, for the winter climate. And I'm going to start out talking about an old snow index, our original snow, snow cover extent. And using this index, we developed this uh, six-step process of how snow cover influences winter climate. And this is on a hemispheric scale. Um, and I'm going to introduce a, a new snow advance index. So, uh, and I'll des describe the difference between the two. But uh, it's much more highly correlated with winter climate variables. And then the last part of the talk really presenting you know, hindcasts and, and forecasts and showing some recent forecasts using this snow advance index or the SAI. And then we bundle it with other statistical predictors and make both temperature precipitation forecasts. And I'll bring examples of the real-time forecast, uh, maybe three or maybe even including this winter, I think, is well three winters, and then I'm going to talk about this past winter, and you know, now it's become part of the common lexicon here in the U.S., the, you know, the polar vortex. All right. So kind of just some background material. I, I assume that most of you are familiar with the, with the Arctic Oscillation, or um, commonly related to North Atlantic Oscillation, but I, I mostly refer to it as the Arctic Oscillation. So on the um, graph on the left, I show this the Arctic Oscillation, and it's just the first mode of variability of uh, the sea level pressure and temperature as well. And this is when, if you take the first the first EOF of uh, sea level pressure 20 north to the pole, uh, this is the, the pattern. Then you get described as a dipole. You get one center of action or one anomaly center here, over the it really encompasses the whole Arctic. It's centered a little off the pole, maybe in the North Atlantic side of the Arctic. And then you have the opposite side anomaly in the um, two ocean basins, one being the North Atlantic seems to be the stronger pole or center of action, then you have a weaker one in the North Pacific. And here's a show, so if the red would be positive, this would be a positive AO. Uh, with, I'm sorry, a negative. I, I like to show things in the negative AO. So this would be the negative AO with high pressure over the Arctic and low pressure in the, in the uh, ocean basin. So that, you know, that's the, the Arctic Oscillation. And then, kind of again, just to orient for the, for the seminar, on the, on the right side, show the mean sea level pressure for you know, winter time. Again, this is all winter, the AO, some of the winter AO, and here's mean sea level pressure. So there are three centers of action. Is the, um, I guess here are some in North America where very well familiar with the Aleutian Low, uh, you know, just there and off the, near the Aleutian, near the Aleutian, there's the Icelandic Low, which is, uh, again, low pressure, um, and near Iceland. And then there's the Siberian High here in the middle of the Eurasian continent. So um, at least in my mind, and again, I'm telling Jonathan, sometimes he thinks I think a little differently than everybody else, but the Arctic Oscillation, you know, to me, seemed like, well, can it just be the variability that you see with the Arctic Oscillation is just the contraction and the expansion of the Siberian High. When you have a str stronger Siberian High, it expands, it expands, and encompasses over the pole. That's when you get this negative Arctic Oscillation. It, kind of, it, it, it expands to include the pole, the Arctic area, and then the uh, ocean, the two ocean low pressures, you know, are shifted to the south. And then when you have a weaker Siberian high, it kind of contracts, into, you know, within, within the, the continental, you know, the Eurasian continent. And then you have an ex, kind of this expansion is um, from the, ocean, the oceanic lows, and they kind of move in into, into encompass the Arctic basin. Now the positive Arctic oscillation. Right. So, you know, very early results, we just found this relationship between uh, Eurasian snow cover um, you know, the anomalies and, and, and the winter Arctic Oscillation. So um, 
here we have, I think, from 19, basically the entropy analysis, from, you know, from 1949, maybe going to 2011 or so. And a lot of times, and I apologize, this might vary a little bit through the talk, hopefully not too much, but I usually like to uh, invert the snow cover index so it, it matches the Arctic oscillation. So you could, uh, they're really out of, you know, you, it's a negative correlation, but I often will invert the snow cover. So, you, I mean, I, for my own, I like to see it, um, you know, this, kind of a similar relationship, linear relationship, not, not the inverse. So, um, yeah, so when snow cover is high, so again, you got inverted. When snow cover is high, you get this negative Arctic oscillation. I mean, for example, here's 1977, 76, 77, the snow covers from 76, the winter 76, 77. So you had a very high snow cover and a strongly negative Arctic oscillation. I mean, the snow cover is actually much higher than, much more, more greater amplitude than the Arctic oscillation that would have. But you can see both are, um, snow cover was high, the Arctic oscillation was negative, but in this plot, they're both shown as negative. And in um, the correlation, so you know, this is over 60 years. So the correlation 0.41 certainly is statistically significant. And uh, I won't talk about it. this this talk, and this really focused on seasonal forecasting, but if you look even, I think if you can see some, um, there's very similar decadal variability. So um, both the Arctic oscillation and the, the Arctic oscillation went, um, was, well, went through this kind of negative period here in the 60s and into the late 70s. and the snow cover was generally high that period. And then you went from this period from the late starting, the late 70s, maybe in the early 80s, to the late 80s, early 90s, where the snow cover decreased and the Arctic oscillation increased. But they, you know, went similar, you know, in a similar, similarly, you know, in that. And then since then, the snow cover has been increasing in general, and the Arctic oscillation has also been going uh, more negative. So then that's just this, you know, this. Uh, relationship with the time series, if you take the snow cover, let's say we correlated, so that was October. October is really the key month, um, and, and really the, the rest of the talk will focus on October snow cover, but here's just a correlation with the full Eurasian snow cover in the winter, 500 millibar heights. And just to show there's more than, you know, it's more than just suggestive, more of a statistical relation, there's maybe something physical going on. If you correlate the snow cover with the 500 millibar heights, you get this pattern that looks similar that I show it started off the talk. This is for probably low pressure, but uh, you know, it's nearly barotropic, uh, this mode. And you can see there's the uh, one high center, one, one anomaly center over the Arctic. And uh, so with, um, if the snow cover is high, the heights tend to be high over the Arctic. And if the snow cover is high, it also tends to be low heights in the ocean basin. So it looks very reminiscent of this negative Arctic oscillation. For high snow cover, it would be a positive Arctic oscillation for low snow cover. So, you know, the thing was quite simple. So our thinking early on was, in, you know, we kind of like to say severe the refrigerator for the, for the whole northern hemisphere. When you, snow cover, you know, increases over the fall in Siberia, um, the month that has the, the greatest increase is October, so you have a very rapid advance in snow cover. This cools the Earth's surface and helps develop a strong, you know, uh, high pressure, you know, in the lower troposphere, and this, this really is the building of the, of the Siberian high. So we have above normal snow cover that, in, that favors stronger high pressure, a stronger development of the Siberian high. So you have this very cold, dense air that's building over the Eurasian continent, but you have also these high topographical barriers um, to the east and to the south. You know, and most famously, you know, Tibetan Plateau. So this cold dense air is a, a much easier time spreading that. What we normally think of, you know, weather systems going, you know, from west to east, but rather from um, from east to west um, t towards Europe, or even north uh, over the pole and into uh, North America. So we have this high, you know, cold high pressure building over the. Uh, recently, what is this cold high pressure or building over the Arctic? At least for here for the U.S. Um, when you have this high pressure, strong high pressure, it then has, you know, could be um, with the right jet stream pattern, then can you have this easy delivery of these, these Arctic anticyclones into the 
into the U.S. here, let's see, you see set a high pressure, a positive PNA pattern, and then uh, north to south jet stream, and these Arctic outbreak, you know, they just slide down the east side of the Rockies. And then when you have low pressure, I mean, low snow cover, a weaker Siberian high, and, and lower pressure now over the Arctic basin, um, you know, so you have a, you know, negative PNA pattern, but you have this mild southwest or even a west flow of air, uh, so tropical ridging, and you know, much milder pattern, and you, you know you don't have this delivery of high pressure into the into the lower 48. Instead, you have this milder southwest flow of air, and you have much much more infrequent Arctic outbreaks. So that was that was our early thinking, but. Um, it, you know, it, over time it evolved and became, it turned out, it, you know, it, it seemed that the, the, the whole mechanism between the snow cover and, and let's say, when the climate was much more involved than that, and, and it wasn't just, ice, you know, limited to the troposphere, it actually involved the stratosphere, the stratosphere became an important component. So we, we have this six-step process. So again, uh, this, you know, here's the timeline on the bottom. In October, that's when the snow cover has its greatest advance, you know, throughout the entire year. Uh, across the Eurasian continent, so you have, so let's say um, here I've shown it, you know, uh, b above normal snow cover, forcing you know cold winter. So we start out with the first step um, is the uh, let me get my cursor back here. Is the first step is that increase in snow cover. Snow cover uh, leads to you know the the high albedo of the snow cover, the the the, you know, the, the, the more, more efficient thermal emissivity of the snow cover and the fact that it's a thermal blanket, you know, between the, the, the Earth's surface and the, and the atmosphere. Also, all these factors help to cool the, 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 the you know, the, the atmosphere right above the snow cover. So, cool, you know, you see, you build up this cold, dense air um, in October, the, the, you know, the Siberian high builds in response to the, to the advancement of the snow cover. So you have a stronger Siberian hot building um, over the Eurasian continent. That's the second step. Now it turns out when you build this high high pressure over the Eurasian continent, um, and the, you know, it actually it has to be and it's a specific location, but I'm not going to really get to it so much in this talk. But um, that is favorable for upward energy transfer from the troposphere into the stratosphere. You know, so was you know, first known as uh, you know Elias and palm flux. It's this vertical energy propagation associated with Rossby waves. You know, Elias and palm flux is two-dimensional. Um, looking at three-dimensional is also called wave activity flux. But anyway, the important thing is to take away this, this third step is this increased energy transfer or flux, upwelling, you know, whatever you have, like to refer to it, from the troposphere into the stratosphere. And when you get a lot of this energy transfer from the um, troposphere stratosphere. This tends to you have the in the stratosphere you have the, the in, you know the winter time you have the polar vortex. It, it when you have this energy transfer, it, it weakens the polar vortex. And in the most um, you know extreme cases, the more the big the more intense cases, you have a major stratospheric warming. We have a reversal of the of the winds when the, when the winds go from westerly to easterly. And when you get the stratospheric warming, you build instead of the polar vortex, you tend to have high pressure, so many high, high pressure anomalies over the over the uh, over the pole, over the whole Arctic. And again, this is stratosphere. You get a pole which shift in the jet, so you, you weaken the jet on the pole wave flank, but strengthen it on the equator wave flank. And where the polar vortex tends to be, in, and I'm going to show this you know, a few examples of this, where the polar vortex tends to be very fast flow of air from the west to the east. Now it takes on a, it includes a much more meridional component, it takes on much more north-south. And that, so that's the fourth step, this, this, you know, this weak in the polar vortex, but that, all those circulation anomalies associated with this stratosphere of warming, this weakening of the polar vortex, then descends, whether it's real or apparent, but that, all those circulation anomalies, and this is on a hemispheric scale, so we went from a regional perturbation, right, the snow cover, it, first response was a regional perturbation, but when it gets into the stratosphere, it becomes hemispheric in scale. That hemispheric scale circulation and you know, all the anomalies then um, propagate down to the, to the surface, and you get the same things that happen in the stratosphere. They happen now in the troposphere, and, um, and they're most closely associated with the negative Arctic oscillation. So you know, higher pressure over the Arctic region, more marinal flow, equator which shift in the jet, jet stream, 
you know, tend to get more snowstorms as well. And um, yeah, so that's that's the final. That's kind of the, you know the end, the end of the cycle. And again, so here, so you have the snow cover in October. The, let's say the building is severely high in November. The energy propagation in November, December, the stratosphere is warming, say in January, and then it propagates down January, February, maybe it <coughs> even the persists into March. Okay, so those are the six steps. So I, I described it in um, you know, for the high snow cover years, which is again the six steps are just repeated here on the right. The high snow cover, but the system seems to be quite linear, and it also the low snow cover years just gives you almost the opposite. We have low snow cover, let's say in October, you get you know, less snow cover. It's warmer, right? You don't get you, you know, the beetles much more uh, suppressed. You have a weaker Siberian high. Um, you have less um, you have less energy propagation or poleward heat flux. Uh, Less energy and that converges on the, uh, into the into the Arctic. The weaker energy transfer from the troposphere to stratosphere. The polar vortex is, this remains strong, right? Um, and you have a very strong zonal flow. Uh, you know, the jet is strengthened on the on the poleward flank. You get less mineral flow, and that all propagates down. You get these positive AO conditions in the, in the troposphere. So very linear. Seems to be very linear. So I'm going to. Um, Present two paradigm winters. I think I'm just. Um, I think you know. I mean, what, you know, we try to show things in averages, but I just to try just pick out two particular winters that, that work as good examples. Um, I picked the winters that had the high, you know, the highest AO values and the lowest AO values. So 1989, um, we had actually it was a record low Siberian snow cover that winter and. From that October, and then it was followed by a strongly positive AO. More recent winter, 2009-10, had a very it had a high value of October of snow cover, and the AO without following winter was strongly negative. And as most of you know, is the record negative winter AO. You know, at least through the uh, NCEP NCAR uh, reanalysis uh, period. So again, the science. So I'm going to walk through the six steps for the, the, the two different two different years, two different winters. But I mean, just want to show you this is not. I mean, this is just 2002. But uh, just showing you this animation, just try to impress on you that the snow cover can. You know, there's a rapid change in the amount of snow covers. You know, at the beginning of the month compared to the end of the month. But this large change in the. You know, and again, you know, so uh, I assume all of you are pretty good with geography. So you know, I'm just. And you can all see my cursor, I hope. But so you know, so here's the area that I'm focused on. You know, it's across you know Russia or whatever. But it's mostly Siberia. This is taking place in the month of October. Um, you know, it's a big change in, in the snow cover, and, and that could have a very profound change on the on the energy balance of you know the Earth's surface, where you know the albedo maybe goes from you know about 20 percent to you know 70 percent or even higher. But anyway, okay. Now moving on to 1988, 89, and 2000. Well, 88 and 2009. This is October. So here's the snow cover extent. You know, the, just an animation of both years. So 88 is on the left, and, and 2009 is on the right. And you know, hopefully, as you see this loop through again, you can see that you know that the snow cover advanced more rapidly, especially towards the end. It was a very rapid advance towards the end of the month, in particular. In that year, so there's, you know, so snow cover anyway. Snow cover advanced more rapidly in 2009 relative to 1988. Now again, uh, the second, so that's the first step. The second step is is building a Siberian high. Now, this, is, this is an old uh, animation I have, but I like I like to use it because I, you know, I think it's pretty striking. So it's um, it's just a correlation of the a winter AO with sea level pressure. It's average for 45 days, and uh, and, and it you know, time steps every five days from October 1st you know, through, through February 28th. And, uh, the purple lines are the high, it, they, they demarcate the you know thousand meter um, height you know, uh, you know um, surface. So you know where where the where the, on the northern side of where the uh, topography you know is, is uh, well it's kind of just marking out the, the high topography in the northern hemisphere the, the northward. The poleward uh, side of it, so it, it, it marks off the thousand meter um, 
probably a better word than that. But anyway, so I'm gonna. Uh, so Excuse me, we'll, Judah. Uh, yeah. Once, uh, once in a while, I'm you kind of all of a sudden fade out. So I. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Just just so you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I move my phone a little, a little closer to me, but um, okay. Oh, no, there you go. I, oh, yeah, hopefully that's better. So I'm sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Please, please, and if anything is you know not coming across clear, I, I prefer you interrupt me than just let me go on and tell me after the fact. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to start animating this, um, this, this. Let's see, until the next start going. Yeah, there we go. So, and I've done twice striking. So you, you know, so you start with this regional perturbation. So this again, this is just a correlation with the Arctic, uh, the winter Arctic ice cream with sea level pressure, and the shading just marks off 95 and 99 percent significance. But if you start here in October, and it's, I guess it's looping through quite rapidly. But if you can try to find it, and it keeps repeating itself. But you can see how we have just started with like a regional perturbation, then which propagates first, you know, westward. And then it kind of expands and, and expands here northward and encompasses the whole pole, and then you get this opposite sign anomaly here, and specifically in the North Atlantic Oscillation. So from this animation, it seems very, very much that this, this hemisphere scale, the Arctic Oscillation, starts out in the fall, you know, as a regional perturbation in Siberia, and then it just kind of expands over, you know, as the season progresses. Uh, Again, I mean, it's a very old animation I've, you know, I've been showing, and, it, and it, to me it's very strange. And again, it certainly it seems like the sea level pressure is very much confined by the topographical barriers. But anyway, but anyway, I just, you know, I thought it was very striking um, that it seems like this, this um, how this Arctic Oscillation seems to start this regional perturbation there hiding out in, in Siberia. Okay, but anyway, moving on. So the second step is, uh, and then that's an average, that was an average made from different years, but here's an individual year. So this is just um, SLP anomalies, so tip and all these as animation I'm going to show, you know, blue is low pre uh, below normal and red is above normal, so here blue would be low pressure and red is high pressure. So 1988, is, so you can see it animating through um, on the left, and um, and again, so this was a year we had low snow cover in October, and then if you follow it, you have, and, and what I'm trying to argue is that that leads to a weakened Siberian high, so low pressure, and now and here's the start of the animation again. Where's my cursor? So you can see here, over Siberia, you got the blues, that hopefully is not um, too faded for you. Um, you can see the blues um, start here in Siberia, and then over time, as the season progresses, that low pressure expands out of Siberia, very much like I showed in the previous animation. You know, it, it covers the Arctic basin, you know, it's not really centered over there, and you get the opposite sign anomaly, which would be high pressure here in the ocean basin. So you get a very canonical, positive AO pattern, you know, in, in the midwinter time. So now in contrast, you had 2009, you had high snow cover, and what I'm trying to argue is that that leads to high pressure over the Siberia, which then expands over time. So you can see here, we started building up this high pressure across northern, northern Eurasia here in um, the, the western, western Siberia. And you can see as, as the season progresses, as we get to December, how that side of this regional pressure now is expanding and it takes over the entire ocean basin. And, and in 2009-10, this happened <coughs> twice. So you'll see the high pressure Again, become regional, more regionalized here in Siberia, and then as you get into February, um, it expands, and now it covers the whole Arctic basin. You get this kind of more canonical negative AO with the low pressure in the ocean basins and the high pressure over um, over the Arctic. And again, I'll just start, let this go through till November. You can see how you have high pressure here over it's it's, it's limited to central and northern Eurasia but then expands and, and fills the entire Arctic, uh, Arctic Ocean Basin, and then you get these opposite signs and all. There's this low pressure in the, in the ocean, North Pacific and the North Atlantic. So very canonical negative AO, and you know, it's a sharp contrast to what happened in 1988. So that's the second step. The next step, uh, well, this is just part of the second step. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about temperature. So I, I made this whole argument that it, it was tied in with uh, warm and, you know, warm, Temperatures, you know, warm boundary, kind of lower troposphere, low pressure, warm temp warm temperatures, low pressure. 
So here in um, 88, where you had the, you know, the deficit in snow cover, you could see these large uh, positive departures in temperatures that first over Siberia, and then as the winter progresses, you know, expand, it expands out of Siberia, expands westward into Europe, and then over the pole and eastward into the eastern U.S. Not maybe the best example for on the, on the, on the North American side, but it looks, you can see very nicely here how these warm anomalies really, which are confined to Siberia as, as, um, as this winter season progresses, expands, you can see it, you know, an expansion here into Europe, uh, the next couple of frames. And then also it comes over the pole and uh, really gets warm now here. We still see here the warmth in, in Europe and the, in the eastern U.S. there. Okay, and that's not in Siberia. And now if you contrast that with 2009, I mean, the, the, you can see how it was really warm at the beginning um, of the period, especially over October, I mean, over Siberia. But as I said, now you can see the temperatures responding to the snow cover. The snow cover made a very rapid advance <coughs> there at the end of Oct October. And, in, and the temperatures respond in kind. It can be very cold temperatures on Siberia. It's limited to Siberia, and then it quickly expands westward into Europe, and then you can see it come over kind of into the east and west or whatever, over the pole. And it'll do this, you know, a couple of times. So even here in February as well, you had this cold spread across whole northern Eurasia and then the east and west. So, um, again, very very nice contrast between the two years. So this is all still really spot of the second, second step, this, this building of this regional perturbation that expands uh, throughout to come hemispheric in scale. Now we're going to show the energy transfer, and this is a you know, little esoteric, but again, I'm just um, just wanted you just to see the difference, in, you know, really in the anomalies of those two winters. So here, first is animating on the left is for 1988-89. So when you the blues represent a deficit in energy um, into that region, um, you know. So in 1988, again, there was low pressure, and I'm trying to argue that leads to less energy transfer. You can see there's a huge deficit here of energy absorption in the polar stratosphere. Right? It's strongly blue. Then you get towards the end, there's some absorption going on there um, in, in you know, lower latitudes. And if you contrast that into um, 2009, we had high snow cover, stronger strength in Siberian high, you'll see that this you know, energy surplus, more energy than, than normal, <coughs> is being absorbed in, into the polar stratosphere. And, and, and so we can um, even without understanding necessarily this whole energy transfer, you can see that much more energy is being absorbed in 2009-10 relative to, to 80-89. So, you know, much more energy transfer absorbed in the polar stratosphere in 2009-10 compared to 89. That's the third step. And again, the next step should be with it in uh, what happens to the polar vortex? How does the polar vortex respond to those anomalies in, in this uh, wave activity flux or rise in pond flux? And I am trying to argue. Okay, this is the biggest animation of the uh, presentation, so it's, it's a little longer to load. So in the 89, there was this energy deficit. Much less energy was absorbed than, than climatologically, um, than, than climatology, let's say, uh, in the polar stratosphere. So here we show. Um, I'm showing geopotential heights and, and I think the anomalies, and I guess the anomalies are in red. It might be, that's right, it might be temperatures, the, the, the orange and the blue shading. But um, anyway, they're, they're almost interchangeable at that, that level in the atmosphere. So here's an 889. This is just an animation of the polar vortex. And you can see it's nearly spherical. Can I get my cursor? Let me go. Here it is. Um, it's nearly in this thing stopped for some reason. Um, you know, it's nearly spherical. You can see the cold, and so it's, you know, here's the pole. It, it, it's, it's staying near the pole. It's staying intact. The cold air associated with the polar vortex is staying over the uh, at high latitude over the Arctic basin. You have warmer air, you know, circling in the, in the um, lower latitudes, in the mid latitudes, let's say. And it's a very you know, a good example of, of the, the intact, strong polar vortex. Now, if you compare it, and I think it's very dramatic, the difference is, so here's 2009-10, where you had um, high snow cover, high Siberian, you know, strong Siberian high. Um, there you go. 
um, and you're much more energy tr absorbed into the polar stratosphere. And you watch, you can see the, this burst of energy come out of Siberia and knock the vortex right off the pole, and it really completely breaks apart. It comes another uh, energy comes out of Siberia, and you know it's really the, the polar vortex is really kind of disintegrated. So very different, you know, it's not very different. Con very, I think it's very dramatic contrast to say 889, the strong of the polar vortex. And so when the cold air is first, con you know, very much confined over the pole, when you have this breakdown of the polar vortex, you can see the cold air then spreads out from the Arctic, you know, into lower latitudes, and you get the cold, you know, you got the reds now, so the Arctic really warms up, and the cold air is displaced equatorward, you know, into the mid-latitudes here in the U.S. and across northern, across northern Eurasia. So again, very, I think, a very dramatic uh, contrast between the two of the cold air in 1889, is confined to the high latitudes, the mild air at the at, at lower latitudes, and in 2009-10, where the warm air rushes the pole, and the cold air gets displaced to lower latitudes. Now, um, so the next thing is those propagation of those of those um, of, of those circulation anomalies to lower latitudes. So I don't have a good animation for this, but um, here's the. Or, I know that, that I developed, maybe you're familiar, it's on the CPC website, uh, polar cap heights. Um, and I thought this was, you know, at the time people were pushing using the Arctic oscillation to show this downward propagation, but um, you know, I'm trying to argue, I was trying to argue that, it, you know, it's not just a stratosphere troposphere coupling, but it's kind of this troposphere stratosphere coupling. It starts in the troposphere, propagates upward, and I wanted to catch that, that kind of precursor. Uh, conditions in the in the in the in the troposphere. So the, well, I thought it was a nice advance. The, uh, the Arctic oscillation itself is hemispheric in scale. If we something more, uh, can catch capture better regional perturbation. So this is just the polar cap anomaly averaged from 60 north towards the pole. So um, again, in 1989, back in, in 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 the fall, you had low pressure dominating the high latitudes, right? And then you had this. Straight, you know, strong polar vortex here, low heights, and then that propagates down here in, in, the, in the winter season. And um, in contrast, in 2009-10, um, you, you had you know the increasing snow cover, uh, uh, you know rapid advance of snow cover, you have building of high pressure, which you can see captured here, which is a tro lower tropospheric phenomena. Then you have the energy transfer, which takes place, and you have the stratospheric warming, and that whole thing, all the circulation anomalies associated with that. Stress warming propagate down, and it seems to happen twice during the winter. I've you know, got these arrows kind of trying to draw you to the energy, prop you know, this downward propagation. So I think in 2009 10, it's much easier to see. I mean, certainly you can see this kind of maximum in the, in the stratosphere, which then makes it later in, during the winter time, the winter months, into the, into the troposphere. But it happened twice, so there's another kind of that stratosphere warming end, but then there was another warming, and then that also coupled down to the weather. I mean, that's not as obvious as downward propagation, but certainly there's coupling. You know, the, the troposphere and the stratosphere are coupled. And um, in, in, in 1989, you can see kind of the stratosphere, you know, got cold, strengthened polar vortex, and that at least. And, and the same thing happened in the troposphere. But, it, you know, it, to see a downward propagation, I think, is a little difficult. But again, I'm not arguing that everything starts in the stratosphere. I'm arguing that it, it starts in the troposphere, and I would say, you know, in both years, you could, you know, see that. Um, I think that the, really the whole this whole cycle really starts in the troposphere, it goes to the stratosphere, and then later into the troposphere. So that's the fifth step. The last step is this negative Arctic oscillation pattern, or, or something that still projects strongly onto it, you know, in, during the winter months. So here's the mean sea level pressure anomalies, 889 versus 2009-10. And you can see that in 1889, the, the, the high latitudes were dominated by low pressure. The blues, and you had here in the ocean basins positive anomalies, though so I guess the one in the Pacific's a little, uh, you know, it's not in the kind of south of the Aleutians where it might typically be or was like in that when you do the EOF, so a little offset, you know, the, but, but, it, but anyway. But you, in, in general, though, you have that low pressure over the high latitudes and high pressure anomalies anyway. Anomaly sent over the mid latitudes, and then in 2009-10 you have the opposite, where you have high pressure anomalies over the Arctic, low pressure anomalies in the ocean basins. So both, well, you know, in 1889-10 this canonical positive Arctic oscillation pattern, and in 2009-10 this canonical negative Arctic oscillation pattern. 
And uh, that seal of pressure, I mean, temperature is what you know, the man on the street cares more about than the, than the seal of pressure. And 889, you can see the very strong anomalies across the uh, positive anomalies across the Eurasian continent, so it's a somewhat to a degree in, in eastern U.S. Uh, but not as strong as across Northern Eurasia. And if you correlate, uh, you'll see this later, if you correlate the Arctic Oscillation, the correlations are stronger with Eurasian temperatures than with North American temperatures. But in 2009-10, uh, strong negative anomalies now, you had the negative Arctic Oscillation, strong negative anomalies across Northern Eurasia and as well across the Eastern U.S. So the opposite pattern uh, for both winters. So again, just summarizing, this whole, you know, the, 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 this mechanism, the cycle. So, of course, you have the, in October and the fall, you have the rapid advance in the snow cover. This builds a high pressure. You get this pressure ridge here, say, in the jet stream over Siberia. That leads to this energy transfer from the, from the troposphere into the stratosphere, into the polar vortex. You get a weakening of the polar vortex or stratosphere warming. The temperature goes up over the Arctic. It happens both in the stratosphere and then later in the troposphere. This, all the circulation anomalies in the polar vortex then propagate down to the surface, and you get cold here, you know, you drop in temperature over the, over the East U.S. and um, Northern Eurasia, and, uh, you know, the strengthening on the equator with the side of the, of the jet stream. So it's, you know, the, the, equator, the jet is a displaced equator. You get, tend to get these cold winters in the East U.S. and Europe, and maybe even uh, more snow, more, usually more snowstorms as well. Okay, so this is how I start off to talk with this this relationship. It's just this you know simple linear, just a time series type relationship between snow cover extent and, and the and the Arctic oscillation, the winter Arctic oscillation. So for this 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 first index, we use monthly values. So it's the uh, monthly value of October. It includes all of Eurasia, and it just it's measuring the snow cover extent. But we then, um, and a lot of it was based on what happened in 2009-10, but so we, because in 2009-10, what, what was not, well, I mean, the Arctic Oscillation was pretty extreme, spectacular. It was, a, it was the record value. The snow cover extent was high, but it wasn't anything, you know, it certainly wasn't unprecedented and historical. But what was, um, pretty much was unprecedented for that year was how fast, that snow cover advanced. So, I mean, it was got the slow start of the month, but the last three weeks it made an incredibly rapid advance. So, we, we developed this index to try to capture not the monthly extent, but how fast, you know, to measure how fast that snow cover advanced. So, this uses, so we developed the snow advance index. It uses daily values. Um, again, thinking maybe, okay, if it's the albedo that's important, you know, let's use maybe some of the more equator word values where you get, you know, you're getting more impact on the, on the solar radiation. So we limit it to equate with a 60 north. But rather than measure the snow cover extent, we're measuring the rate of change of snow cover. It's just taking, um, you know, kind of the derivative, the first derivative of, of the snow cover extent. And you can see here, this is, you know, so this is from our paper. And so again, the, the blue line is the October snow advance index, and the, the black line is the winter AO. And here we detrended it, um, and you know it's, a, it's like really an eye-popping correlation, 0 0.86. So, um, I've got a question. Sure. What do you consider snow cover an inch? Whatever the satellite sees. So I mean, I, 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 they probably say one centimeter, but yeah, it's, it's so this is all derived from satellite. So. The, the snow advance index is limited to, uh, actually, the snow cover extent, do I have it on the previous slide? So the satellites go back to, let's say, the early 70s. You have satellite for snow cover extent, monthly snow cover extent. And then I use a proxy index that someone developed going back further. But um, since this is using daily values and it's from satellites, you know, it, it's only been operational since 1997. Uh, but you know, whatever was ever measured from satellites, and I think um, they give a value of one centimeter. So again, I mean, uh, if you're familiar with the Arctic Oscillation, and it's considered by most, I would say, and it certainly has been considered up till now, um, 
and unpredictable that it's really just kind of it's um, the LP oscillation is um, you know certainly the variability in it is maybe due to internal noise uh, of you know, internal dynamics of the atmosphere you know it's due to randomness chaos you know whatever you'd like to say so it's inherently unpredictable so um, you know so to have you know this high of a correlation you know with something that precedes the Arctic oscillation is pretty amazing now of course it's a very short time series um, and you know we'll see what happens when it's longer but I mean I, I think it's pretty pretty amazing you know to have something that people would assume is to have a correlation about zero I mean to get even by chance to get this such a high correlation so, and, and certainly has the potential to really I think revolutionize at least winter forecasting as much as the you know and this winter certainly gives reason to pause but as much as the you know knowing ahead of time the Arctic oscillation will, will help improve um, winter forecasting so I'm just trying to show that this thing is robust I mean we, we also developed a daily so we, I mean it's daily but the weekly values for snow cover do extend further back in time so here we have um, the, in this lighter blue, I guess this um, the snow the snow advancing index used weekly values. So instead of uh, let's say 31 points to develop the index, we only have like four points. So much more degraded index. But in red is the is the traditional snow the uh, older or the traditional <laughs> you know the one we we've, we've been using longer the snow cover extent index. Um, and you can see that this weekly value over this longer time period is is improved over it, and then. Here's over the more recent, you know, the, over the t I mean, this is the weekly snow advance index, not the daily, but over the period that we have the daily values, you can see that the, the week using this snow advance index is much better, a much higher correlation with the AO than, than the snow cover extent. I don't know, for reasons I'm not, I don't understand. I mean, the snow cover extent over recent, uh, over the past 15 years or so, is, is, uh, the correlation has really dropped off. But for the snow advance index, it stayed pretty, it stayed pretty consistent. Okay, so here on the left is a correlation. If you just take the AO and you correlate it with, with sea level pressure, so it's the winter AO, right, developed from sea level pressure, you just correlate with sea level pressure, you know, the pattern you get, I mean, not surprising, you get this kind of dipole pattern with one sign anomaly over the over the Arctic and an opposite sign anomaly over the mid latitudes, especially over the uh, ocean basins. If you take this SAI and you do the same correlation, you say, this is contemporary, you know, obviously it's the AO basically with itself, but it's also contemporaneous. It's winter AO with winter sea level pressure. Here you're taking the SAI, which is, you know, in October, and you correlate with the winter sea level pressure. Uh, you know, you get this also very high value of correlation. It's not as high uh, as obviously using the AO itself. But I mean, the, but the, the thing is that the pattern, I mean, is, is you know, besides the high correlations, I mean, there's this striking similarity between the two, two you know, Patterns is, uh, I think, um, <laughs> uh, to me, I think whatever. I think, I think it's quite striking. And if you know, if you're used to doing looking at climate um, correlating, trying to find relationships in climate, you know, where leading correlations. I mean, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, and, you know, the pattern correlation I think between these two figures is about as close to 0 0.9. Here, so that was looking at the surface where you know. I've, Certainly made a large part of this presentation showing that this influence is in the stratosphere as well. So here's the correlation of the AL with the 50 hectopascal height, so 50 millibars up there in the lower to mid stratosphere. And again, you get that. Um, you know, so the AL is kind of barotropic mode. So you get you know one high, high anomaly over the Arctic and an opposite high anomaly in the mid latitudes. And you know if you do the SAI. With this winter heights again, I mean, again, a you know, very similar uh, uh, pattern. So you have, if you have high snow cover, you would get, or let's say here low snow cover, you get a, a stronger polar vortex, and, and, and higher heights over the latitudes, higher snow cover, you get a, a higher heights in the in the polar stratosphere, you know, weakened polar vortex, and, and, and lower heights in the mid latitudes. Right, uh, let's get down, you know, to the thing that's that's important. The surface temperature, so here is pretty this is known as the quadrupole. When you take the AO or the NAO you call it with temperatures, you get one sign anomaly across northern Eurasia, and you get the, that same sign anomaly also in the eastern US. 
And then you get the opposite side anomaly, the other two poles are um, the, the Mediterranean and North Africa, so they're opposite to Northern Eurasia. And then the, like I like to call them the North American Arctic, Alaska, Greenland, Northeastern Canada, they're also of opposite signs. So, um, you know, when you have a positive AO, Northern Eurasia and East would be warm, the American Arctic would be cold, the same, let's say, for the Mediterranean, and then if the um, Arctic Oscillation is negative, it's cold across Northern Eurasia, East US, and, and warm in the North American Arctic and um, the Mediterranean. And if you um, correlate the SAI, right, so it's an October index with the winter temperatures, you get that, you certainly capture that same quadrupole. Uh, again, the, the amplitude is less than using the winter AO itself, but, uh, you know, the pattern is, you know, strikingly similar. You know, and, and as I'll show, I mean, to get any kind of skill for a lot of these areas is, is, is unprecedented and has, certainly hasn't been achieved with other indices. So, I mean, that's just the, the raw correlation. What about, uh, here's cross-validated uh, Heimkast. So, you, it's, here's the Heimkast are cross-validated. So, I use first, uh, well, I switched it up. But the AO is on the right. So, you can see you have skill. So, red, I just showed the positive skill here. Red is positive skill. Blue would be, let's say, neg or, you know, less than zero would be negative skill. But, you know, as, um, why well, everybody would like to predict the AO because it has such a good skill across the northern hemisphere continents, and especially certainly in the extra tropics. So you have a positive skill across northern Eurasia, the North Africa, the Middle East, and as well in the eastern U.S. and the North American Arctic. And if you look here in the, using the SAI, you also have um, positive skill in Northern Eurasia, North Africa, you know, the Mediterranean, the eastern U.S. and, and North American Arctic. Again, the, the skill is less than the winter AO, um, but, but the pattern is there, and, and the SAI can actually use to make a forecast. You, you don't know the winter AO ahead of time. There's no predictive value to it. And for comparison, you know, so, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of, I mean, when it comes to seasonal forecasting, um, I think I'm saying anything too controversial, I think, you know, especially no. I mean, the seasonal forecast almost, you know, starts and ends with ENSO. But when you correlate, let's say, I um, mean, again, it's just uh, taking a simple, uh, just taking an index of the El Nino, Nino 3.4, and you correlate it with the uh, northern hemisphere temperatures, again, I'm just showing positive skill. There's um, nearly no skill across, no, you know, the Eurasian continent. And, in the, and then across North America, it's very much limited to the western, whatever, the Cordero region, I don't know, anyway, the west coast there, Canada, northwestern U.S., and there's some skill here in, the, in Texas, you know, whatever, the southwest and, and the Canadian prairies. But, you know, even that skill is quite uh, marginal. So, <clears throat> you know, very, very different than, let's say, using the snow base index that has skill over the northern hemisphere land masses, and, that, and so, you know, is, is, does not have show skill, no inherent skill in, in those same regions. But they do have skill, you know, in different parts, and they can, you can take the snow and they can complement each other. So we, you know, so we, let's say here's a, now I've included snow and using ENSO as a predictor, and I, you've got some decrease, at least I don't fully really, so you've got some decrease in the, in the skill, but you certainly have an expansion of area of the positive um, areas that have positive skill. And then we have one more predictor. We use uh, like a kind of an index for the circulation, zero pressure. And this is basically what our model is. Um, but you can see now where you just started out with ENSO. I mean, you had almost no skill, positive skill whatsoever across the northern hemisphere land masses in the extra tropics. They have a very wide coverage, and certainly in, in areas that you really care about. I mean, the eastern U.S., um, you know, and northern Eurasia, you know, including a lot of Europe. So and, and the Far East. So you really c capture the the, the 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 population centers. <coughs> excuse me, the population centers of the of the northern hemisphere. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. I'm a, what time is it? Uh, I'll try to wrap it up. I, I, <coughs> um, 
this is just to show that the models really don't capture this snow, whole snow AO relationship. The models don't capture. I'm not going to get into it right now since lack of time. But so here's a comparison of the scale between. Um, so a lot of people say, well, <coughs> you just a, you just it's a very simple relation when you take an in, in ENSO index correlated with temperatures. You're missing all the nonlinear feedbacks. So here the dynamical models are. Do you know certainly the focus of, of uh, has, has been to improve the you know the the ENSO uh, phenomena. It's coupling maybe with the extratropics. So here's the the Canadian model. There's the seasonal forecast model. There's the um, an entire of European models. And here on the right, I'm sorry, this the CFS on the top left, European and the Canadian is on the right. And here's the statistical model filled in both the you know positive and negative skill. Um, so red represents positive skill and blue negative skill. And you can see the dynamical models are mostly dominated by blue. You know, our, our statistical model we developed is mostly red. And remember where I point out where, you know, where's the one region ENSO has skill, at least in this linear sense, it was right here across the uh, west coast of North America. The models ha have that same skill, but they don't have skill elsewhere. So, I mean, the, the models don't look really any different in their skill than than, than the, the simple statistic um, linear correlation with, with um, using an ENSO index. Then I show temperature, but here's um, here's the correlations. I mean, Europe, Europe much more than U.S. is strongly um, there's a good relation between precipitation and um, and the NAO or AO. And you can see here we show the correlations between uh, precipitation in Europe and, and and this SAI index, and we're stifling its statistically significant. So, I mean, temperature is difficult. Precipitation is impossible. But this is showing some, you know, promise and that has potential to predict precipitation across, um, the, you know, the European continent. All right, so how about some, uh, so the, everything I show is high cast. Here's some, how about some um, real-time forecast. So, just step through since 2010-11. Here's a forecast I actually made at a prediction workshop. It's, you know, it's on the right at the time. And here was what was observed. So, I mean, Pretty, pretty amazing. But I mean, that was probably many people suggested after they made that forecast to retire because they'll never repeat that success again. And so far, they've been right. So, uh, but uh, still, I, I think it's still pretty incredible to have a forecast that good. Uh, you know, a forecast you know that was presented in in, uh, in October for the winter. Um, and just comparing that here, so IRI does a nice aggregation of. Um, a forecast. I'm just showing here the observed temperatures. Here with the, our forecast. And then here's um, IRI kind of this, uh, kind of aggregates all the forecasts from the different forecast centers, and you can see much different. Really doesn't capture the the, 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 the large scale pattern across the northern hemisphere, which it was a strongly negative. Turned out to be strongly negative AO that winter. Uh, here's uh, from 2012. Again, not as good, but there's still. Um, so the correlation, pattern correlation with Eurasia was 0 0.42 and North America was 0 0.44. Um, forecasted a positive AO and, and, ne and positive temperatures in the U.S., but it was much, if you remember that winter, obviously it was like striking how warm it was. But still positive skill. Here's again from IRI. I just, um, you know, again, if you look at the kind of this forecast center forecast, um, definitely, you know, not, it really shows no, I think it really corresponds to what to what happened. Um, here's from last year. So this is the December, January, February. So we had the negative AO. Again, it was cold across northern Eurasia, and that's what happened. The Eastern U.S. did you know something funny where it was warm, but still overall um, it was a pretty skillful forecast. And again, here's IRI, um, you know, which is basically just predicting warm everywhere. And then if you look at JFM. Um, now the, the North American for you know skill is, is is excellent, very good correspondence to the pattern. I mean the correlation was like 0 0.8 or something between North America, but the ocean was good, but it actually degraded a bit from the DJF. So I mean the, the Northern Hemisphere pattern correlations I think for both DJF and JFM were about 0 0.6, but the skill did shift around from between Eurasia and North America that winter. But again, you compare to IRI, which is just, you know, I mean, this from the forecast centers, the uh, ECMWF, the CPC, um, maybe from Canada or whatever. But I mean, just warm everywhere, which this is really not what happened. So what about this winter? Um, the Eurasian snow cover extent was the third highest. This is the old index, just using snow cover extent. Here's a kind of just put in there this um, 
this article that came out of Bloomberg from, you know, based on the snow cover, North Freeze in January blames Siberian snow now. I thought it was pretty um, prescient, at least on the journalist part. And um, what about, but we, we use the SAI now. The SAI, so here's the SAI through this past um, winter. So, the, you know, the values are here. The SAI was about negative one, so I've inverted here to compare with the AO. And, and the AO and the NAO certainly were both uh, strong, were positive, the NAO more so than the AO. But the SAI, and here's the SAI also shows the past few years, I mean, which these have all been used in operational forecasts. I mean, it's certainly still, still capturing quite nicely. The, it's better the AO than the NAO, but really, really not nicely uh, capturing the, um, the, the interannual variability in the AO. You know, and this is, again, not just hindcast mode, but in, in real time operational forecasting. The problem is that a good forecast in the AO didn't get you, um, well, about the show, it doesn't get you a good um, forecast uh, of the winter temperatures necessarily. But, um, Again, I, I think one thing that was really striking to me, and I, I wanted to maybe bring a, a comparison, and I, and I forgot to include it, but here's that energy transfer from this winter. And so if you can look here, starting in late December, it'd be, you know, so Pablo means there was a, you know, more energy transfer from the stratosphere, I mean, from the troposphere into the stratosphere. It was very active. I mean, to me, that was striking. I don't remember another winter where it was so active, uh, just continuously active. You can see from that end of December, right, right, which proceeded right before that polar vortex event in the early January, Stream out and just stayed that whole way and it's continued to stay through here you know, right through the end of the month. Uh, to me, I don't recall another winter like it, just how active the wave activity flux is. And here's an animation of the polar vortex from this winter. Yeah, I think what happened immediately was a bit of distortion, but what I, you know, I think what's really striking, so it starts out again kind of um, contact here, the cold air is over the Arctic, though there is good cross polar flow here in December from Siberia into the U.S. But then you, know, you get this, these perturbations that are hitting on the polar vortex starting the end of December, and you get how it gets all elongated. And you, know, you can see how it gets elongated, and these, you get these cold kind of pools over both the eastern U.S. and Central America. And, you, and this just keeps happening over and over throughout the year. There goes another episode there in February. And you kind of get these lobes that extend from the polar vortex. Um, from, you know, so it's knocked off, the kind of stretched out, and you get these cold pools. In, you know, in the same it's just going to start over again. I just, I, you know, I think it's hard to a bit of a maybe chicken and egg here, cause and effect. I mean, the, you know, the vortex itself is is reflective of the temperatures in the troposphere. So if it's cold in the troposphere, you're going to get the vortex. Will, but but also, I mean, I, I think it helps to visualize what really happened here this winter. And I, I think, at least again, in my view, you have this very active energy transfer happening all winter long and that kept perturbing the vortex. It, didn't, it never fully broke down. Had it had broken down, like in 2009-10, the energy flux would have stopped because the critical line would have dropped um, down <coughs> at least through the stratosphere. So, the, the, but, but you see you, you have this kind of distors, distortion of, um, of the vortex, but not quite, never quite a breakdown. And that led to this, and if you look at the temperatures right from this winter, so here's the observed temperature, here's the forecast that we issued you can see the cold, right, is right where that vortex kind of got stretched out. You know, you have the over here, obviously, the North America, mostly in central part of North America, and then even Central Asia it was very cold. We had that warm uh, lobing kind of uh, in over Europe and in East Siberia, Alaska. It was warm as well. Here was our forecast. I mean, um, uh, you know, it was weird about this. I mean, with the snow advance index, we were. Um, expecting this positive NAO, and so warm Europe, warm Eastern U.S., I mean, the warm Europe worked out great, the warm U.S. obviously not. So a mixed forecast, but it was, you know, it was a very difficult uh, forecast to do. Here's for um, <coughs> JFM. I mean, I, I, you know, I, certainly when I saw that, when I saw the energy get active, you know, I kind of wanted to get away from, I thought this warm forecast is really never going to work. So, I mean, so I used a switch, actually, from this, FAI to the snow cover extent because I know it would get me a cold forecast. And the pattern, of course, the amplitude is off, but the pattern is quite excellent. Though, again, from a hemispheric scale view, I mean, Europe <laughs> now went cold and, you know, and it was warm. I mean, parts of Eurasia here were correct, but Europe itself, you know, was warm. So, it was, you know, it was, it was, um, it was a, you know, there was a give and take. I mean, it, you know, it was not like 2009, 10, or 10, 11, where if you just, Anticipating the L correctly, you're going to get the whole hemispheric pattern. This was very much more complicated than that. So, you know, it's certainly a mixed forecast. And 
And, and you know, it's kind of, if you live and die by the AO, I mean, you, you know, where the AO is limited, so will the forecast be? So good lesson. Um, but no, let's compare, and, I, um, and I'm really running out of time, to look at, and this is really the last point I want to make is, um, the, here's the dynamical model. So, I mean, you could say, I mean, one thing I want to point out is this really strong warming in the Arctic, and then you have these cold continents. And the dynamical models were very warm. Here's for DJF. Um, you know, and uh, the, you know, the Eurasian continent is all warm. The U.S. is warm. It's some cold here in Canada. Here's the European is on the right. This is from the different European models, and this is from the NME website. That I'm sure you're familiar with. You know, so it's just um, ubiquitous warmth, warmth everywhere. Now as observed, and you go, okay, maybe JFM, the model will catch, finally catch on to something. <coughs> there, if anything, they were, they were even warmer for JFM, you know, compared to. Um, for, uh, compared to the observations, I mean, there's no cold anymore in the U.S. in either forecast, and it's certainly very extremely warm across Eurasia. Um, and you know, there's this a lot of the, the um, headlines for this winter. You know, um, you know, what's what's the cause of this extreme winter? Is this extreme weather tied to, to global warming, polar warming? And, and you know, a lot of people said, no, it has to do with natural variability. I'm, I'm in the camp that it has to do, it's not natural variability, and it's tied to the Arctic warming. Here's that dynamical model forecast on the left, here's the observed, here was our forecast from two winters ago. Um, you should see sort of a lot of warmth in the, in the continents, and, and, the, and I, 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 ocean, you know, I mass out the oceans, but if you include the oceans, you can see this bullseye of warmth over the Arctic, and that warmth spreads out to the continents. All right? This is the dynamical, this did not happen in the observations. Right, and you know why is that? And, and if you look at um, this from this winter again, you had the warmth of the Arctic, but it was cold over the mm -hmm. continents. Um, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the dynamical models, you have that bullseye of warmth over the Arctic, and then it spreads that warmth over the continents. So very different in what's going on in the models. And every year this happens. It's not just the past, but at least the past five, I think, the seven years has been pretty consistently in that way. But this is a side point, it's really not the main part of the talk, but given how this winter that was in a topic that came up, I just kind of want to introduce it, uh, but that's kind of, you know, a seminar all by in itself. So just in summary, a six-step process has been, uh, that we've identified that starts with snow cover, advance in the fall, development of the Siberian high, stratosphere troubles are coupling, and then finally ends with the phase and amplitude of the winter Arctic oscillation. We've also developed um, a rate of change of the daily snow cover extent, which we call the SAI in October, and it's more strongly correlated with the Ar winter Arctic oscillation than snow cover extent. And you know, even since we've developed it, that continues to be the case. I mean, the SAI has has, has been very still remains very highly correlated with the Arctic oscillation. So this winter, in, in, well, in Europe, that the SAI was a great forecast. In the, in the U.S., not not, not so much. Uh, it was a poor forecast, yeah, and the snow cover time was a good one. So, anyway, but that was kind of this winter where I think it seems to have been exceptional. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to impress the point of this whole summer. I was, the, I think the SI shows great potential improving winter temperature forecast. For many regions, are not, not a well correlated with ENSO, right? ENSO doesn't give you skill in the eastern U.S. temperature. Doesn't give you skill uh, certainly across the Eurasian continent. I, I think anywhere in the Eurasian continent. Um, and the SAI can give you them, and together they can, you know, certainly they complement each other, and together can, uh, you know, lead to improved skill. And I think this winter was a good example. Um, I, you know, I, where the dynamical models never seem to change at all, uh, though they, they should be as, as they get initialized. And I don't know that, um, but I, I think that the, up up to recently, I think I've tried to advocate that the seasonal forecast shouldn't be static; it can be used. You know, I don't know how much analogous to a you know daily weather, daily weather daily weather forecast where you you know you're looking at the models and updating as such you know you make changes as needed. I mean this one is a great example of that um, certainly with at least on my part where the forecast changed where I anticipated you know we had the the SAI was low there was strong low pressure developed over Siberia at least early in the season that then changed and went to, to high pressure and, and the energy flux started to get much more active at least. We follow a forecast of that, and the forecast became apparent it was going to become much more active. So switched, the, you know. So we made we made an adjustment, whether it was a good adjustment or not. But we, as I showed you, I mean, the forecast for the U.S. definitely changed 
from warm to cold, you know, in mid-process. That didn't happen for the dynamical models. And, so, and certainly I think using the, the six steps that I presented, you can make, you know, that you can monitor the forecast and make adjustments as needed. And this winter is exactly, that's exactly what happened. It doesn't happen every winter, but this winter was a good example of that. And again, I'm not, not really part of the f s seminar today, and uh, I'm sorry if I'm going late. This is just one point I want to make, though. I do think what has happened this winter, you know, there is a connection. There is a connection. I don't think it's just random that the warm Arctic and, and the cold U.S. winter, North American winter, is somewhat connected. And, you know, it's not just natural variability. And again, that's a whole seminar in itself. But, you know, one, one part of the reason I, I think so is because, you know, that, that why the dynamical model is so poor, you know, why are they missing it so bad? They, they, they take that, they have that warm bullseye and spread the warmth to the whole northern hemisphere, and it's not happening, you know, it hasn't been happening for, not for you know, at least five, six, seven years now. So anyway, so I do think there's a connection there, but again, that's, I, I bring it on because it, I think it was so relevant to this winter, but it's a topic in itself. So anyway, thank you. I'm so apologizing I've gotten over a little long. Well, thank you, Judah. I sure appreciate it. Uh, any questions uh, from anyone? Yeah, I, it is interesting. I, I thought it was uh, fascinating uh, to notice when you put the uh, the SAI and the ENSO together that um, you got a, a pretty good uh, uh, had some good correlations there. You could get a lot of uh, skill in, in, in predicting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, um, you know, it's not just a, you know, it's not a baby step forward using, um, well, yeah, look, there's a lot of controversy, um, this idea of snow cover is, is labeled controversial. Yeah, I, I may not agree with that, but obviously, you know, <laughs> but, and, and it's, I wouldn't say, you know, there's no, there's no rapid, up, you know, adaption, ad adoption of that, in, at least in the forecast setting. I think in the, in the business, from the commercial side, the private sector, they've been much more readily open-minded, you know, to, to incorporating into making forecasts. Um, but I, you know, I do think that this, if, if, even if you're not, even if you know you're somewhat uh, trepidatious, you know, uh, you want to go slow about the, the snow cover and using it into season four. I mean, I think the idea that I presented, even. even the strategy troubles of coupling can be, you know, incorporated to really to make big improvements in the forecast. I mean, the seasonal forecast is very is very difficult. It remains so, and, and um, you know, it's, again, I mean, and so is important. I think it's more important, you know, in the tropics than in the extra tropics. But it's, you know, it's it's, it's, it's globally it's, it is the dominant mode. And I'm not saying it, you know it should be thrown out. It should be used, but you, can, you know, they do complement each other. I think, and and together can help to really improve improve forecasting. Are the slides, go ahead. Are the slides presentation going to be made available? Is that a question to me? Yes, it is. Uh, anyway. and, or you can share it through me. But go ahead, if you wish. But to make the presentation available? If they want to okay. present it to their own staff. And and to see some of the graphics better, you know, more close up. I mean, I can make a, I can make a, I'll make a PDF available. The animations won't work, but I'll, I'll make the PDF available. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, and this, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll send the PDF. I mean, if anybody wants anything more, uh, you know, you will, you're happy, you know, more than, um, you know, you can contact me and I'll, I'll, make, I'll make it available to you. But the presentation, I'll make a PDF available. The animations are not going to work, obviously, but then if you're interested in more, pursue it, you know, if you'd like an animation from me, something you saw that you particularly liked, I, you know, I'll, I'll work something out if you contact me. So, and, and John has my email address. Right. Very good. Well, <laughs> Judith, th thank you again for your presentation today. We sure appreciate it. Hey, welcome. It was my pleasure. Well, take care, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for our science sharing uh, webinar, and we hope to see you again uh, soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.